feel free to talk a little bit. Oh, okay. Okay, here we go. Um, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have uh, literally hands down one of my favorite guests. Uh, the amount of respect and honor I have for my guest today is she's I, she's a real experiencer of you know the secret space programs. Her case has been verified. You know, I'm talking about is Penny Bradley. She's uh she was DNA modified in 1955. First abduction was in 1959 at age four. Spent five years at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia at a six month side camp trip to Camp Hero. Used at Long Island NY Jump Gate to Mars, where she turned over the, to the Germans. Spent 25 years as a part of the German militia and 25 years as a navigator on a ship. And then this was the first of such many abductions. She was returned to 1959, where her mind had been wiped and she didn't know of her family. And her website is www.spaceportals.net. And then she has an Odyssey channel. It's Penny Bradley on Odyssey, which we're going to show some examples of today. And then she still has a YouTube, but she's not that active on there. It's YouTube Penny Bradley on YouTube. And I want to give her a big warm welcome to the show. Uh, Penny, thanks for coming back on again. How are you? Um, health is getting better. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give a plug to somebody else if that's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Mornian did, uh, energy work on me yesterday and I'm feeling better. Wow. So, yeah. He's uh, he comes on my show. He does tarot on my show. I, yeah, I, I know he uh, specializes in that, right? Yeah. I, I, contacted him because i had a recurring issue with humans <laughs> and uh i wanted to know what he could tell me about that and and the first thing he did was say uh, basically damn girl you're in pain <laughs> so he offered to do uh, healing work on me and i'm feeling a lot better today what what happened? Like what what happened? To you do you mind, do you want to talk about it or no? Uh, I'd rather not talk about it in public. Okay, okay. Um, well, I'm glad that you're feeling better though, and that's a big shout out to Matt because uh, he does do amazing work. I know he's amazing at tarot. He's amazing at healing, and uh, he does all kinds of healing, different modalities. You know, he's he's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. He did a really good job with me, and uh, he was very generous with his time doing it. So, yeah, that's cool. So, guys, check out Matt too. And uh, so, where should we start off today? What where would you like to start off with? Well, after you asked me if I wanted to talk about the verifications for the secret space program, I saw a link where. Tony Rodriguez had just done the same thing on Journey to Truth. And I will state for the record, I did not watch that because I did not want to be stomping on his toes. So whatever he said, I'll watch it later. But this is what I would, these are my answers. Yeah. We're not in competition. In fact, Tony and I are good friends. We've been friends since we were both first public in 2016. So I have no problems with Tony. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you've done a really good job better than anybody else about proving the actual validity of the secret space program. Like if anybody can go back and watch like your, your lectures you've done for conferences where you've done deep dives into the history of the secret space program and the actual validity of it. Is that correct? That's correct. What happened was when they activated my memory, I had this basically a core dump everything was a 55 year lifetime was dumped on me at once and it was all in german so if and all the traumatic stuff was on the top so if i was going to know what i was remembering i had to do the research now some of these other guys their memories are all in English, so they know exactly what they were remembering. I didn't have that luxury. So I've done years of research. My memories were activated in 
2013. So I've had a solid decade to do the research and I didn't go public for three years. I was sitting there doing research, taking care of business, making sure I understood what I was remembering and getting as much documentation for it as I could because my initial my initial initial reaction was I had this memory of being in a cafeteria with other kids in school uniforms that I never wore on earth. We were speaking German and then these raptors came through the wall. It was just like Jurassic Park. And I knew that couldn't have happened on earth, but I didn't know where it was. So I did a lot of research, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it amazed me. Here's one thing I, I was going to ask you. I was just thinking about this. Who do you think, do, do you know, who who freed up your memories? And what do you think that did? So there has to be like a benevolent side versus a malevolent side as far as like people who want this information out versus people who don't. Is that, is that okay. kind of what you're thinking? It was, it was the Russian desk at the NSA from um, Camp Mead, Fort Mead. Wow. These guys stayed in contact with me afterwards until they were killed. In fact, the boss of the unit taught me how to be a dissident and not be arrested. So you'll watch me. I go right up to that line and I don't cross over it because <clears throat> um, Werner, Samler, and the Aches taught me this is where the line is you cross it they can arrest you and throw your ass in jail and so I come up to the line and I won't go over it because frankly I'm too old and in too bad a shape to survive jail but they've made your life a living hell too right the the people that are uh, they they would like to I'll put it that way They've they've messed with a lot of stuff, but actually right now I live in an apartment with my partner. Together we have enough money to live comfortably. Neither one of us could on our own. Uh, our bills are paid. We have an older car. Uh, if I could be healthy, I would have no complaints. They've even stopped shooting at me, which is a shock. <laughs> wow. So, you know, yeah, they're probably still listening in. And I occasionally feel the electric stuff that they send in here. But they're not shooting me with energy weapons anymore. Uh, the last time you were on the show, we or one of the time I know you were on a couple of times. You we talked about like how to block um, V two K because it, the frequency of V two K. Like you, you have a cap. You said right. Yep, I have a cap, and I'll show you what it looks like. It's dorky, but it works. See, the point is to cover your both ears and the back of your head because that's where they generally, the ears are the most important part because that's where they're hitting those bones. And so the cap has to cover the ears. But um, we were gonna talk about the evidence. Now I'm going with evidence that would hold up in court not what would hold up on the internet because the internet has gotten so absolutely ridiculous about what they want that it's impossible to prove. They're just basically telling you, I don't believe you when they ask for, for evidence. So when they ask for evidence, I pack up my little bag and I leave. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm homie, don't say that no more. Yeah. Yeah. So in court, eyewitness testimony is used to convict people and send them to the death chambers. So if you look at my channel, both, YouTube, what up now? Uh, both YouTube and Odyssey, and I'm working on Rumble since I have enough donations to cover it again. But <clears throat> um, if you look at my channel, I have eyewitness testimonies. Yeah, we're talking folksy and we're talking like a, a coffee clatch because I found people relax and you actually get more information out of them that way. But they know they're on record when they're talking to me. Now, I've shared a couple of archival videos from other people. Um which one's this? Um, it's not showing me. Oh, it just says Nockwaffen V2. Oh, V2. This is V2K. This is the V2K. In this one, I went through and found the patents and blueprints for the voice to skull technology. And I used um, references from psychology journals where they, where you can start in the 70s early 70s with the Frey effect, F-R-E-Y. And um, you can um, follow the, the production of the V2K up to 1989 when it was used in the um, Gulf War. It V2K is why the Iraqi army surrendered their weapons because they heard what they thought was was Allah telling them to surrender. Wow. So this this is a serious major major kind of a of a technology and it's being run through the ice cube neutrino array in Antarctica. Oh, that's why you brought up Eric Hacker. That's why I brought up Eric Hacker because he's an eyewitness to that, that technology. And a couple, several years ago, he paid for Lou and I to come to his house in Alaska. And we spent a week with him and his, his lady and we went through banker's boxes of documents that he took home with him. Pay stubs, uh, tax forms. He didn't want to put them online because they have a social security number. He's got he's got the the gold standard DD-214 from his service in Navy submarines. He worked for Raytheon in Antarctica for a year. They're a defense contractor, right? They are part of the military industrial complex that runs ICC in space. What's that mean? Can you, for people that I'm, I might not un completely understand, but I'm, maybe the audience might not either. Can you explain like, like a better idea what that means? That I kind of have to go back into the history. The Germans went into space first and they were followed. They went out first with the Americans subservient to them. And as soon as the Americans got enough technology to think they were equal, they formed their own space program. And it was primarily uh, Solar Warden which was at that time in the solar system, and now it's spread out. But the military industrial complex who had access to all this stuff because they were building it for the Pentagon, 
made their own. So interplanetary corporate conglomerate was what a certain person basically copyrighted. Uh, Ileana, the star traveler, worked for them, and she calls them planetary corporations. Will Nutter calls them the Alliance. A lot of other people are just calling them the military industrial complex. They're all the same people. The Germans call them bankers in space. Literally, Banker im Weltheim, bankers in space. And if you know anything about German history, you know that German people hate bankers with a purple passion. In fact, when they use that phrase out there, they usually spit through their fingers when they say it as a curse. Wow. <clears throat> What, why did do they why do they hate the uh the bankers so much I, we have to i have to know That's more about a that a long long story what, i have a question does it have to do with like the rothschilds and like their involvement in world war ii it has to do with something called the treaty of versailles at the end of world war one and it has to do with the Rothschild bankers that paid for Napoleon and then paid for World War I and then paid for World War II. And in between the last two world wars, there was a thing called the Weimar Republic. And during the Weimar Republic, the bankers starved people to death by printing money as fast as they could, where it took bear wheelbarrows full to buy a loaf of bread. Well, if you've got people that are on a pension, like widows, orphans, military veterans that are disabled, those people can't don't have that kind of money. They don't have that kind of income. They were starving to death. They couldn't buy food. They couldn't buy coal to cook it with if they'd had it. And it snows deep in Germany. So from the point of view of the German people, the bankers were genociding them. They hate them. Yeah, it seems like the Rothschilds were a bunch of trouble for everybody, right? I mean, they were trouble for us. They were trouble for... <clears throat> Or, well, I mean, I have I have friends who are from that family, so um, I want to state for the record that just because you're born into that family doesn't make you evil. It's yeah. their it's their business empire that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, is your friend that woman who came out and she said she's a Rothschild? Is that is that who who you know, or is that no, other people? Um, it's it's uh, there's other people. I was wondering if that lady was legit though. Like I was, I didn't I, know. I I don't know which lady you're talking about. I I, I can't remember her name. I, I I saw her one time and I was like, wow. I wonder if she really is a Rothschild. Like I was like, that's, that's probably the... if she says she is, she probably is. Yeah. Because they're they're a family like any other. They marry out. They have kids. The kids marry somebody else. They have a different last name. You know. Yeah. It's just you know it's it's. I it's, mean, my great grandparents had thirteen kids. How many descendants do you think they have now? A lot, right? Yeah. A lot. So we're looking at some of these families had a lot of kids so there could be a whole bunch of them out there and no i don't know all of them yeah so uh there are folks out there who are starting to come forward with stories some of the stories are couched in religious talk You'll notice I try to avoid the religious talk 
part of that is because our community is about evenly split between Christians and New Age, and they hate each other. Yeah. And I would just as soon not be part of that mess. I agree. So um, people ask me all kinds of things that drift into religion, and I'm like, nope, not going there. So I try to keep my testimony 3D real. Now, there are aspects to my work out there that kind of overlap with paranormal. But they're not religious. They're because reality is multidimensional. Um, when you start exploring those other dimensions that spaceship travel through, that's physics. That's not religion. And yeah, a, a lot of people can't wrap their head around it. It's, so, it's people, I, I think it's because it's so hard to believe, you know, but I, I, I think like if you're open minded to it and we realize that we've been lied to about everything, it's, it's not that, you know, it's not that hard of a stretch. Well, like this, this ship in the background here, this is a patent for Which the, I see it in your, oh. That's the that's supposedly Val Thor's uh, store ship. That that Craig Campbell oh, no. Bossa sent me that. Oh, it's on my. Okay, it's on mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. Oh wait. Here, I'm sending. It. I'll I'll put it up now. Hold on. I'll I'll share it. Or you want to oh, share? Yeah. Okay. okay. This okay. one you're you talking about. Share. I think. I I was talking about the TR three B patent. That's a ship. 95% of the people who see that in the sky are going to assume that it's an ET, but it's not. These were built in the 1980s. They're already obsolete. They use a limited um, anti-grav engine. That's the common name for it. Uh, it's electrogravitic something or other. But they use they use uh, this cen central part of where the circle is. That's the engines. And then the things on the tips are the are the driving lights. And you Edgar Fouché worked on them. He brought out documents with him whenever that he went public. He was telling the public, these are not ET. These are American. And they're built in Utah. And yet you have people all over the world seeing those and thinking they're seeing an alien craft. Yeah, there was even a couple sightings of them here in Pittsburgh. I know that um, I was checking out Stan Gordon's website. You know, Stan, he's an old school, like paranormal. You know, he's a Bigfoot and UFO guy. And he uh, he's had a UFO hotline open since the uh, since the 60s, you know. So mm -hmm. people call from all over Pittsburgh. They find his number and they'll call in and they'll call about if they've had a sighting or if they've had a Bigfoot sighting and he gets some real interesting cases. And there's, 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 uh, there's, there's ones of people that are there in their pool and they see a black triangle flying over above, like out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like just bizarre, yeah. like black, a lot of black triangles here in Pittsburgh for some reason. Now, are they all human or, or some alien, some human, or would you say they're all human? I would say that the TR-3B is an alien reproduction vehicle. Okay. There are aliens. No, we're calling them non-human intelligences now. Yeah. But there are non-human intelligences who use a similar shaped vehicle, but it has a different pattern of lights. This pattern of a central 
central large light and then smaller lights on the corners, that is American. And those things are come equipped with laser weapons and and masers, which is a laser that's based on microwaves instead of light. And they're one of them in the wrong hands would be a weapon of mass destruction. You get hit by one of those things, even on stun, and you're going to know it. Uh, I've been hit with seven different energy weapons since, since um, 2016. And when they went to do my spinal fusion, on my neck two years ago, uh, almost exactly two years ago. I think it was two years ago today. And uh, in the doctor's report, he talks about he could not, he had never seen tissues like mine where the, the muscles and nerves were welded to the bones. Welded. Well, that's the word he used was welded to the bones. He had to separate all that stuff to be able to do the spinal fusion. And he was just absolutely, I have no idea how this is going on. Well, I do. If he'd asked me, I could have told him it's a result of being hit with energy weapons. Yes, I have medical proof of what's happened to me. Okay, you you remember the old astronauts? They'd be put in a centrifuge to test how they responded to G forces. Yeah, when they would do an MRI on these people afterwards, their brain hemispheres would have separated. I have an MRI that shows a man's thumb can sit between my, the two hemispheres of my brain. Oh, oh my god! Because I've been spun. I have Is that medical- hurt. Does that does that hurt or do you get, I get like, headaches? headaches? I get headaches and I sometimes have trouble with vocabulary. Words don't always come up. That's why you'll see me search for a word. It's because I can I'm thinking visually instead of verbally and I have to translate it, but it's a result of having been spun. What do you mean by spun? What, what you... In this centrifuge, have you ever sp- You've seen the thing with the long arm and it just spins round and round and round and round. That's for like space war- space training, right? Is that what yes, you mean? Yes, that's for space training. Remember, I first went into space in 1964. They wow. did a lot of things then that they don't do anymore. So <clears throat> I have medical proof and people don't understand that you know you can match up what happened to you with what's wrong with your body now okay yeah i've had other issues too i grew up on a dairy next to a cotton farm i've been sprayed with pesticides that's why every time i lose weight i get sick there's there's lots of issues with all of us, because they wanted to make sure that they diluted the the evidence stream. Now, we're talking about evidence for the SSP. I've got some things that I can share with you if you want to let me. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Here we go. Okay, give me a minute to pull it up. Okay. I made a I made a file. Okay. Um This is a very short video. It doesn't actually say anything at all except um where to go are you seeing this i'm not i was going to say it's not sharing yet okay but i gave you 
it should be you should be able to um zoom just disappeared on me okay there okay this one this all it all it does is is you can read what Franklin Delano Roosevelt said about uh, he's the one that made it um, he's the one that made it all top secret on February 27th 1942 now remember they keep trying to tell us that that there were no UFOs before 1947 at Roswell this is proof, absolute proof that. So this is an FBR classification of a downcraft, 1942. It says, I have considered the deposition of the material in the possession of the army that may be of great significance toward the development of a super weapon of war. I disagree with the agreement that such information should be shared with our ally, the Soviet Union. Consultation with Dr. Bush and other scientists on the issue of finding practical uses for the atomic secrets learned from the study of celestial devices precludes any further discussion, and I therefore authorize Dr. Bush to proceed with the pro project without further delay. This information is vital to the nation's superiority and must remain within the confines of secret of the state secrets. Any further discussion on the matter will be restricted to General Donovan, Dr. Bush, the Secretary of War, and yourself. Now, were these people like MJ? We know one of them is the president. Were these yeah. other people like MJ 12? Or uh, yeah, Dr. Say? Bush is, is uh, Papa Bush, who was president in the 80s. That was his father. The one who was the head of the CIA as well. Yes, he was the head of the CIA. This guy was not. This guy was his dad, but he was involved in MJ, MJ-12. Wow. Okay. Man, they really had their hands dirty. No kidding. <laughs> okay. I mean, from like wars to like, you know, like just the government secrets all over the place to, you know, like, I mean, every one of them. You know, from Bush Jr. to like the regular, you know, to every single one. Wow. Now, I, I talk about that I was shot with <clears throat> um, energy weapons. This is how easy it is. They've got an M16 that instead of firing rounds, it fires an energy weapon. This is called a do. Wow. When you get hit with this, it feels like you got hit with a log wherever it hit you, except that it's electric and it burns. It burns the tissue, but it leaves absolutely no evidence on the skin. So if you go to the doctor, they think you're batshit. And right there is the U.S. patent number issued February 17th, 2009. The first time I got shot was in July of 2016. So this was a relatively new weapon then. And uh, you cannot find that. I attempted to find it, find it in a patent search and show the link, but they won't. You you can just keep hitting the button and they won't bring it up. Who's filing these patents? Is it like defense contractors? I would yeah. say. Yeah. And they have to, like they can't just keep it under wraps. Like they have to file patents, I guess. Or what do you, what yes, would you say? they have to file a patent. Otherwise who, if the military or the company doesn't file a patent, then everybody else in that chain of supply can patent it. And then they have to pay um, royalties. So they have to tell their secrets, basically, if they want to get and, anything done. But that's why it won't pull up is because it's considered a secret patent. Wow. They don't release them right away. Yeah. 
Okay. So if they had this, like, and, and I heard they were using this stuff back in the Iraq war, right? Or, you know, yeah. dues. Yeah, this is considered to be a non-lethal weapon because they can shoot you and disable you. But it doesn't necessarily have to kill you. I mean, this is this is real real stuff. These are being used on on the group of people that call themselves targeted indi individuals. Most of them are are experiencing this on a regular basis. So they're getting it. They're getting hit from far away. I guess like you can do. You can do. You can. I guess you can use one of these and like target someone without them seeing you. You know, or something yeah. like like so like some like say, say through my window here. If I'm targeted, like. Someone could be in an apartment like a, from like a couple houses away and hit me with a do and I would never know it, but I would feel the effects of it, maybe. Yes. That's interesting. It, it will definitely go through the wall and definitely go through windows. And depending on what kind of crystal that they use in it, there's a crystal that's based on iodine. And if they do hit you with that... It causes internal hemorrhaging that they can't be stopped. So there. Why? There's... Why is the right? Uh, that makes me wonder because I, I heard um, people say that some people are actually like supplementing with iodine right now. I wonder if that's a psyop because they get their. No. Be, be the reason why you I would say that you is need, like you need you need iodine for your thyroid to work. Yeah, I I, I, but I was iodine, thinking, it. but yeah. iodine can be used for more than one thing. So it can be deadly too, is what you're saying. Not it deadly, be, but it can be like it it's something your body absolutely has to have, but it's something that can be used in a deadly way. Because be, here's where I was going with that. I was saying, like, if we're if a lot of us now are more supplementing with iodine, does that make it easier for them to hit us with an iodine weapon or an iodine no. based weapon? No. Okay. Okay. It All has right. no effect. Okay. Okay. When I first came public. 2016 i talked about that mars has a lavender sunset there's one of the rover pictures of a martian sunset wow they don't have a lot of atmosphere to keep it everywhere but based on the the height that the uh you know where the atmosphere stops is more stuff going on there underground would you say yes it's too it's too damn cold at night and you get these dust storms that come through and they build up so much uh static electricity that they fry your electronics so you have to be underground. Wow. Uh, they also, Mars also has clouds. And I've said that since I was first public. That's a Martian cloud cover. Wow. So let me see what else I can pull up here. I've got a lot of photos from... Um, from the uh, Martian rovers. So, um, but first I'm going to go through some of the pictures of the German ships. Okay. Let's see if I can get these bigger. They're a little bit JPEG effects. So here's a set of German ships that were actually built. Uh, people who have seen various craft would have pretty good idea of, of these so 
that top one looks like the acorn craft people talk about like what also yeah. like when they think about kexburg like it reminds me yes. of kexburg but, uh, but but do you have an opinion on kexburg do you think it was like russian or german or do you think it was like something just you know i've heard a lot of theories what makes sense to me is that the americans were playing with the technology they recovered oh okay that makes sense yeah okay let me see if it's gonna cooperate man that's all written in german too huh that's like yeah it's all written in german so okay and i'm guessing these are some of their older crafts or, do, or is there new, these newer ones would you say uh, these were older ones from World War II. Wow. And here's the second set. Let's see if I can get that a little bigger. Nope, it's not going to cooperate. So it's all written in German, and you can see the, the styles pretty much say, stay along the same lines. And then we've got this one, which this one, the diagrams, this comes in several different sizes, but you've got it sitting right here with people standing on it and it's next to a two-story house. Wait, it didn't, it didn't change. Um, we're still looking at the three. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So. <clears throat> I will admit that I don't always have it together. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. I'm not, you know, this is great. This is amazing stuff. This is a photograph of a real Hanabu with real humans standing around it and this is next to a two-story house wow they were enormous yeah they have to be if you're going to have a crew and go into space and these balls on the bottom those are the engines and they gave off a hell of a lot of electric of electricity and they gave off way too much radiation and the crews died horrible, miserable deaths from radiation poisoning. Wow. Radiation, radiation sickness is no joke. Uh, we did have kind of a, a nasty insult kind of a thing that we would say, oh, you're a Hanabu pilot. And that would be like saying you have a death wish. Oh, wow. So those were the Hanabu, which we know were German craft. Now, I want you to look at this. And I'm going to make it bigger. And this is Simjaze's, Simjaze's ship. From Billy Meyer. You see the ship here? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that look like a German ship to you? It does. Simjaze spoke German. She had a swastika on the wall inside the ship. I have maintained for years that the Pleiadians, the Plejarans, Plejarans, however you say it, are rogue Germans from the space program. How, how, what made you come to those conclusions? Like just from your time in space? From my time in space, from the fact that they... They almost always speak German. They almost always look like the Scandinavian Nordic type. 
tall, built, blonde or light colored hair. And uh, they have an attitude. By the time Simiaze was done with Billy Meyer, she had him castrate himself. Oh, my God. People don't talk about that. I think he was having an ex an interaction with a German from space. I do not think he was seeing an ET at all. Wait, can you repeat that? Wait, what happened? And because I, I was stuck on the fact that she made him castrate her, so I was thinking that was so horrid. Like, why? Yeah. Let's take over one thing at a time. Why do you think she had him do that? Like, what? What? Like, because she was a sadist. Oh, she was a nut. Okay, okay. Did did I ask you this before? Do you think that the the uh, that Semyazi could have been um, uh, Maria Orsic in another life or no. something? No, Maria Orsic is in the. In the bottom of the ocean. Wow. She was that. on a submarine heading to um, Antarctica. And she had her ship on board it. And uh, the Allies sunk it. Wow. She was lost at sea. So that's when she died. That's when she died. Yeah. So they don't talk about that <laughs> these ladies got killed in things too. But she did manage to keep possession of her primary saucer away from the Nazi regime. So even then, not all Germans were Nazis. Yeah. And we so. talked about that before, like the, for the people that don't know, like there was the Germans out in space that kind of they wanted to not be affiliated with the Nazis. Is that correct? Or they wanted to not be affiliated with Hitler. Uh, some of them shared those beliefs. Some of them did not. But when they got out into space, they found out in a real quick hurry that um, all of us, no matter where we're from, on earth have more in common with each other than any of us do with anything out there yeah that makes sense so it, they are now very the racism that they had for the aryan type has transferred to terran human Now, they are very intelligence-oriented. They are very production-oriented. But they're not the same as they were as, as Nazis. I mean, they've been out there a long time. Yeah. They have, anytime you have space, anytime you have hyperspace flight, you have time travel. So they went back 400 years to create colonies. They've been out there a long time. Wow. Most of those people don't even know who Hitler was. Yeah. And the Nazi regime lasted 20 years in Germany. And anybody that's wanting to copy it since then, they're reviving something that's dead. So... Yeah. Okay. Stop. This is all so interesting. This is a really great presentation. This is uh Okay. Um now I got okay, this one. This one is um Mark McCandlish was a friend of mine on Facebook. And he did some work with, he was working with other people, but he got descriptions of an alien reproduction vehicle. And it appeared to have been built in the 1960s. And he made blueprints for it. And this. The mark 
his friend Brad's initial account was a fascinating story with a degree of veracity and plausibility, worth exploring and doing some research. But was after all just one man's tale of a fairly unbelievable event, concept, and machine. However, this subsequent research led Mark to some other very compelling... That's Melinda Leslie. Yeah. ...including numerous scientific patents and other sources, such as respected quantum physicists, which finally convinced him of the likelihood the ARV might be a very real thing. The first verification... This is Mark. ...of uh, the story that I picked up on the, uh, the alien reproduction vehicle was around 19... I'm turn it up a little bit. ...it was the uh, first air show at Edwards Air Force Base where they actually had the beaches on display. And in the course of that air show, I had occasion to uh, join up with some clients from uh, Rockwell International, and they introduced me to this fellow who claimed at the time that he was working with the Air Intelligence Agency. His name was Kent Sellen. He uh, claimed that he had inadvertently seen the same craft at Edwards Air Force Base North Base facility in 1973. And I said, well, when? How? Where? What were the circumstances? He said, well, I it was a crew chief. He said, I worked on Bill Scout's plane and we were test pilot. And he said, one night, my ship supervisor said to me, go off the North Base. They've got a power unit out there, a ground power unit for an aircraft that's leaking or failed or something. So we need to take a tow vehicle out there, go out, pick it up, bring it back. Well, instead, what happened is he comes up off the dry lake bridge, rolls right up on the tarmac, and is going down these rows of hangars. They're all Quonset style hangars back there. And he stops in front of the first one with the doors cracked, expecting to find this defective brown power unit. And what does he see? He sees this flying saucer sitting in the hangar, hovering off the ground. So I, I tried to say, well, what happened? He says, well, this thing, you know, it's flat on the bottom, sloping sides, a little ledge around there, and then a dome on the top with these little glass things on top, looked like there was a camera under each one. And I said, really? He said, yeah. No, you know, no landing gear. It was, it was hovering. And I said, let me borrow your pen. So I took out a Kodak lens cleaning tissue package that I had in my camera bag. It was the only thing I could think of to draw. And I just, I did a quick sketch of this alien reproduction vehicle as described by my friend Brad Sorensen back in 1988. And I said, is that what you saw? And he said, oh, you've seen one. I said, no. And, but I wasn't sure until this moment that the story was absolutely true. And so that was when I knew there was a second point of confirmation. I woke up at the foot of the second and there were footsteps running up to me before I could even turn to the left and see there were machine gun barrels in the throat. Another one was appearing to the rough way to close your eyes and get off the ground and blow your head. So they put a hood over his head, blindfolded and hauled him out there for 18 hours. He agreed to that. He was. Um forced to sign some non-disclosure documents about that, but then was given some additional information about it, <coughs> details about the ejection sequence for that vehicle and so forth. I didn't know anything about. So that gave some validity to what he was saying. Brad was his original witness person. In addition to Ken Sellen, there is at least one other witness on record testifying to the existence of what he describes as a UFO at Norton Air Force Base which may well have been the ARV. I, uh, I can uh, discuss Norton Air Force Base, and that's uh, as a result of all the military aerial command bases underneath of their facilities. That uh, there was one facility at Norton Air Force Base that was close hold. Not even uh, the wing commander there could know what was going on. And during that time period, uh, throughout my career, it was always rumored by the pilots that uh, that was a cover for in fact the location of one uh, UFO craft and the reason for that location was uh, folks that uh, could come out, land at Norton, play golf, uh, be part of a golf tournament and so forth and during that process could go by the facility and actually see the UFO. I became so excited about the prospect that this thing really was real and that there really was some technology about it. And uh, so uh, every chance I got, I would strike up a conversation with someone I knew in the industry, and I'd ask them if they'd ever heard anything about this. And I was talking to a fellow by the name of Paul Shepard, who was a UFO investigator. I felt that he'd have you know, a little bit more uh, knowledge about the kinds of things that were going on in this area of research. 
And he put me in touch with a couple of gentlemen, uh, Gordon Nobel and George Willick, who was a physicist with Hercules Aerospace up in Sandy, Utah. And they were very interested in the story. I started off uh, as an aeronautical engineer when I was in college, and I got really interested in what makes you go. go. And, and so I just kind of pursued the trail of the technology as opposed to the aliens and that kind of stuff. And so I did it as pursue the technology. I got lucky. Got really, really lucky. I got my hands on a lot of really good data. Uh, one of them had an ongoing correspondence with uh, UFO researcher Wendell Stevens, a retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, um, who participated in sort of these UFO chasing exercises up around the Arctic many, many years ago. So um, Gordon sent a request off to Wendell Stevens saying, you know, we know we have that you have this big photo archive of all these different UFOs that have been seen over the years, do you have any photography that even resembles what we're describing in this drawing that I've done? And it turned out that there was a case. I obtained uh, photographs that were uh, taken in 1967 by a military pilot, Harvey Williams, flying a C-47 for the Air Force at 12,000 feet approximately 25 miles southwest of Provo, Utah. Uh, this particular vehicle matches the so-called ARV uh, in all proportions and respects in terms of the detail of the shape of the craft. It, it really uh, bore a striking resemblance to the ARV with, with one possible exception, that was that the synthetic vision system, the little bubbles that accommodated the camera systems on the outside of the thing were quite a bit larger than the ones that 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 was you know, reported. And so when I thought back to something that Brad had said, and that was that many of the components on the ARV, like the ejection seats and the camera system, uh, were all off-the-shelf components. He said that the uh, the ones that he saw in 1988 uh, looked just like the, the little bubbles you see hanging from the ceiling in the casinos in Las Vegas. So when I thought back to the camera systems that were available in 1966, of course, they were much larger than they were in 1988, and so the larger acrylic bubble seemed, you know, to uh, give some veracity to the photography as it was presented in these pictures taken by Harvey Wade. One of the things that came up in the investigation was the fact that um, a number of the witnesses starting in 1988 described the vehicle that they saw looking like it had been around for a long time, chips in the paint, fingerprints, you know, greasy handprints and that kind of stuff. The uh, the material around where the ZIS fasteners brought the panels together all chipped and scratched and stuff like it had been around for a long time. When I uh, talked in 1991 or 92 to Kent Sullen, uh, you know, he clarified that he'd seen this thing in 1973, which was, you know, what, 15 years or something earlier than that. And then the photograph from Wendell Stevens showed that this thing may have been operational as early as, you know, June or July of 1966. So it certainly supported the idea that this thing had been around for quite a while, maybe even uh, earlier than that. Look at some of the photography uh, of UFOs going all the way back to some of the earliest photography we know of, McMinnville, like Oregon, for example. You see the same general layout, you see the same general configuration, the flat bottom, the sloping sides, a little dome in the middle, sometimes pointy, sometimes almost like the top of a cylinder that's been chopped off, sometimes a perfectly round dome, sometimes even, you know, like a cone on the top. So it suggests that, you know, there's, there's um, uh, many different variants of the system, but the overall arrangement of the components is basically the same. You notice these don't match the Hanabu. So these would be American ARVs, right? These are the American ARVs. So the the the, the ET craft look a lot more like what like nut, less nuts and bolts, I guess, right? Like I, I guess you can see rivets in these craft if you look up close. Yeah, you can see seams and rivets in these, but it's not in the back. the alien versions. 
So are most most um are most craft that people are seeing are they are you think would you say they're government or SSP? I would say they're government or SSP, most of what we are seeing. There are some that are real non-human intelligences. Now, part of the problem we're having is when you travel in hyperspace, hyperspace is another dimension. So when you come out of hyperspace, people watching you think you're in a, think you're an interdimensional being. And when you say interdimensional being, they automatically go to religion. But hyperspace is physics, it's not religion. And interdimensionality is a mode of travel. It's not where they live. Now, each separate frequency has its own ecology and its own sentient life forms. And when we travel through them, we can be very disruptive to them. So there are established holes, tunnels through hyperspace that if you're going to a long established place, you're expected to use the holes that are already there instead of making new ones. But that's just common courtesy to the people that live there. You know? Yeah, that's that's amazing. Like, um, it makes me think of the people that are uh, taking psychedelics and they're seeing like interdimensional beings and like, they're they're doing it that way like like what do you, is that the same hyperspace like is it the yeah. same like it's the same hyperspace okay let me open this picture for you uh this one is from turkey so the the language in it is in turkish but it shows the um, it shows the functioning in a Hanabu of how it operates. You have this superconductive coil, and it's all the way around the ship. It's actually circular. So wow. cross section doesn't show that it's a circular coil around the ship okay that's what that level is is a coil and you have a base metal and a top metal and then you have the induction in the middle and you're basically creating <clears throat> um a toroid toroidal system that generates electricity and while it does this it creates an anti-grav effect um, when you're flying in it the sense it the sensation is that you have created a gravity well in front of the ship so you're falling into this hole that's what it feels like inside Wow. And the pe the people are in here, in this part, inside the coil. And some of them are lucky enough to be above the coil. But it it's it's a very high. How many difference. how many people would you say one craft can hold? It depends on the craft. You have some that are set up for for no more than four people, and you have some that will hold hundreds. Like, is that one of the, some of the big mothership types we see? Like, those are, I mean, like, is, well, is it the, Han the Hanabu were big enough that they would hold about 40 people. Wow. And let me see if I can get um, one of these others to pop up. 
<clears throat> I have lots of, of designs of ships in here explaining how they operate. Um, this, this one, um, you can see it. Okay. Okay. This one is also Turkish. But this one shows how that it's actually a coil around that it's not that it that it's a circular function around a central and it it explains uh, exactly how it operates and even gives formulas for folks that can read it i figured most of our people would not but this is this is how they're built inside <clears throat> When you can pull up a schematic on it, that means this is real, right? Yeah, look at that. It says copyright sent sent in a ball, whatever that means. Sent like, in a ball. That's a company in Turkey. Wow. Do you remember the uh, the uh, the Turkish sightings uh, back when uh, Roger Lear came on Art Bell? But he said they saw alien in those craft. But I, I, I wonder if like those were real sightings and that they were real uh, pictures, you know, you never know. But uh, Turkey's always been a big place for spot sightings. Like it's always been a big, uh, you know, like um, UFO. We place. have artwork from the ancient past in Turkey that show non-human intelligences. So there are still these beings visiting. Now, there's a lot of possibilities as to what they could be. And when people ask me, well, what are they? I go, yes, interdimensionals. They all travel interdimensionally anyway. Uh, from Whoa. inner earth, from the, the far future, from the far past, from outer space. Yes, all of the above. Well, what were your theories on the gray abductions? Like, do you feel like they were working with the military or were they working with the reptilians or is that just all like... They were working with the... The, <clears throat> the grays were given permission to interbreed with us because they were a dying race okay so that's true then and grays are usually humans that have been through either biological warfare or nuclear warfare those are the ones most likely to be us from the future But they were given permission to interbreed with us. And their game plan is to replace us with those hybrids. Is that why they can't tell us anything? Because it would disrupt the timeline. But then, like, if they want to replace us with hybrids, would that matter then? Or what, what do you think? They, they're creating a whole new timeline. But... um they tell you flat out on, on Zeta Talk. They have a website, zetatalk.com or something like .net.org, something. Uh, Zeta Talk talks about why they're here, who gave them permission, and what their game plan is. Wow. You don't have to guess. It's out there. It's on the internet. Yeah. Okay. So next set. Okay. Um, I have an assortment of uh, 
things from, um, okay. These are what we call um, Mars anomaly photos. It's where they get a um, gigapan from NASA and they hunt through it for things. This is a classic. Um, yeah, are we sharing? No. No. Uh... This is a classic Mars native human dwelling. Wow. It's a roundish shape with a doorway and it vaguely resembles a skull or a helmet. A so does that go right? Do you think that goes right into inner earth? This is on Mars, but yeah, it goes right. No, into, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it, it doesn't goes, make any sense. Inner Earth. <laughs> it, it I mean, inner Mars, inner Mars, it, I guess. like It goes underground. Yeah. So um, the next one is pyramids. Oh, my God. It's amazing. And you'll see several pyramidal type structures. This is Mars. Uh and I guess, the, I don't know if they're going to show or not, but they're processed by Rami Bar Elan, and he does excellent work. Um, this is another classic Mars native human dwelling. It reminds me of Star Wars. Well, it's a similar kind of climate. If you go by the concept of form follows function, this is the upper dwelling with a tiny opening to keep the sandstorms out. And the majority of the dwelling is underground. Wow. This shows a house here. It shows a house falling down here. I have no idea what this thing is. It yeah. could be anything. Maybe a road, torn apart road. Yeah, but this is obviously a house. Yeah. So. So do you think there was like a big. One is, this one is out of focus, but this is another one of those. Mars native human homes. Who do you who 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 do you think is living on Mars? I gotta ask you that. Like, did we ever talk about that? Like who who's living on Mars right now? There's a city of 10 million Anunnaki, blue collar Anunnaki. On Earth, we call them tall whites. There is at least one outpost of actual Draco. <laughs> There are tribes of Mars raptors. And they're like wandering tribes. Uh, they used to be a spacefaring race and they are in their dark age and they were just starting to come out and be maybe farmers. And the Germans attacked them. So the Germans tossed them back into the Stone Age. Wow. Uh, there are sentient telepathic ants in huge colonies. How big are they? Uh, eight, nine feet tall. Oh, my God. Um, when Doris and I went over, Doris Neely and I went over my, uh, what I remembered versus what was in my file. She said that there were sentient flies there. I don't remember them, but this was, you know, if anybody pays attention, I gave you the link to that interview. 
Um, Doris's background is that she used to work for the CIA in the DC office. And she worked her, her way up from being a simple typist to being the archivist. And she had some issues along the way and she ended up suing the CIA for racial discrimination. It went clear to the Supreme Court because of the, the classification levels. She had to get permission to sue them. Anyway, she got permission to sue and she won the case. So she got a million dollars in the 1980s under President Reagan. But she uploaded a lot of our files from SSP and Montauk people. Wow. And she has a near photographic memory. And she's in her 80s now. And she used to have the physical files in her in her possession, but her house burnt down the day I had my spinal fusion surgery. I heard about that. I heard it was yeah. someone who was like mad at Daryl or something. Um, there's someone who took credit for it, and I'm not going to give him fame and fortune by talking about him by name. Yeah, fuck that guy, because I like Daryl, <laughs> and I've heard good things about his mom, you know? Like, I, I mean, Daryl was always good to me, and I feel bad for what happened to Daryl about the January 6th stuff, and then I've heard just nothing but good stuff about his mom, so, like, yeah. they sound like really good people. Well, I have I have a lot of affection for Doris because she did she put herself in harm's way to talk to me, and Daryl Daryl reached out to me and offered me a show at a time when I was ready to throw in the towel. Being a whistle being a whistleblower telling the truth is one of the hardest things in the world. A lot of these people out there will just tell whatever's, whatever they think is going to sell, but I've been telling the truth as I know it. For what? Seven years now? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. So, like, it's... it's uh, do you think do you think uh, Daryl's mom would ever do an interview? Do you think or do you think she doesn't want that kind of attention? Oh, she loved doing interviews with me. Uh, she had trouble with the mic. And she she would absentmindedly unclip it while she was talking and then put it in her lap and you'd lose all the sound. So she... <laughs> I was going to say, maybe we could do a show with like me, you and her. Because maybe she would feel more comfortable if, like, you were on with her, you know? Well, at this point, it would be, she doesn't have a computer, so it would have to be on the phone. And I'm not, I'm not sure the people she's living with would let her stay on the phone that long. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, but yeah uh... I'd, I'd love to have her on. Uh, she made an appearance at, um, I did that round table of Montauk folks. It was the first time there had been a round table of Montauk survivors rather than the perps. And she came on that and she verified that she had had files on everybody that was on there. Wow. So that was, that was incredible. So, um, yeah, I would, I would not be opposed to that. It's just the actual logistics might be a problem right now with she's unable to do her own cooking and cleaning. So she's in a long-term care place, not a hospital, but what we in California call assisted living. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, what I was going to say was like, if you think you have memories of the, or, oh, okay, like for, here's me, for example, I've had people tell me that I might've been at Montauk, that I might've been in the SSP, but I don't think I have a foul. I don't think I have, um, I don't have any memories. I, I don't have any memories at all whatsoever. Like I've woken up Count with your blessings. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know, you know, if I was or I don't think I was. I don't know. But I've had people tell me they remember me there or seeing me. So like what I mean, do you think regression would be the best way to like look into that? Or do you think regression is like 50 50 or what do you. Regression works decently. If there's something there. Yeah. Cause sometimes I feel like, like when we, when we regress, I sometimes wonder if people are pulling from like the Akashic field, you know what I mean? Like the, the I don't the... know. Um, I've had three regressions and one of them, I got caught in um, Omega programming and I had a really hard time pulling out of that. Wow. So if you actually were in the programs, regression can be dangerous. It's the best way to get your memories back, most efficient, fastest. But it can also trigger omega programming, which is the self-destruct mode. So be really careful about that. I've got some uh, NASA pictures of forests on Mars, if you want to see. Yeah, yeah. I have about five more minutes or 10 more, you know, five more minutes. I got another show at 7 p.m. Eastern. So or in a half hour of your time. So. OK, like, so you see the trees. Let me see here. Hold on. Let me... And and. Oh, yeah. The water. These are at the South Pole. Wow. So it is growing some vegetation there. Oh, yeah. These are what could these be besides trees? Yeah. Snow, trees, snow. Do you think these areas are more habitable or would the South Pole has more water and it has the trees and the tr these are not the same as earth trees. These are they survive the uh, the nights. The nights get really 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 cold. Do you agree with the people that say there was some kind of like nuclear blast there at one point or? Yes. You... There was a nuclear blast. There's um, isotopes con consistent with nuclear bombs. These are, are further north from the pole trees. I hope this isn't what Earth becomes someday, you know? I mean, if we nuke it, it could very easily. These are lakes with trees. Wow. This is the Mars I remember. Remember I grew up there first. Yeah. Trees. These are all NASA photos. And this is from the Mars Anomaly Research Company. One thing I wanted to ask you about was why are there such a large amount of Anunnaki there? Did they lose their home planet or what? And, do you, and are you a Nibiru thinker? Or do you believe in Nibiru or do you think they came from somewhere else? I believe in Nibiru. The Anunnaki own this solar system. Okay. So they own like the... This, this is the, home to them. So they own this planet basically. And Yes. As far as the get galactic authority, the government of the galaxy is concerned, the Anunnaki own here. See, you, some people say it's the reptilians, but it's the, or the, I've heard the reptilians are underneath the Anunnaki. That's what Gerald Clark said. The reptilians are over the Anunnaki. What do you mean by that? They're like... Um... I'll have to pull up a map. Okay. It's so exciting that all this stuff really exists, you know, and it's, it's I mean, I'm open minded to it. And I, I just really think that we're being lied to about so much on a grand scale. It's like, you know, and for what at the end of the day, you know, it's just like people holding on to old paradigms, not wanting free energy to come out. Like, you know, it's, it's crazy. Like, it's like, 
I mean, like like Roswell was 70 years ago and they, they haven't even come out with anything about Roswell yet, you know? So I don't think we're ever going to get any. I don't know where they think we're getting. They're not going to tell us anything if as long as they can avoid it. Yeah. Okay, there's one of these maps, if I can find it, where I drew a picture. Well, puppy poo. Okay. This is a National Geographic map of the Milky Way. Okay, what did I do there? All right, wherever it is. Um, we are right there. Wow, it's this, enormous. Yes, this is the Orion arm and it's part of the Sagitt. This one's the Perseus arm and I need to make that bigger. Come on people okay it's not going to cooperate but okay you've got the orion empire is here and the draco empire is here they're right next door to each other and we are smack in the middle of the Draco Empire. Now, the Anunnaki may own the solar system, but it's just one teeny little dot that's too small to even show up on the map. And the, 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 the Orion part is the reptilians, right? A different reptilian group. The Draco are one reptilian group. The Orions are another one. Wow. There are over a million reptilian races in the Milky Way galaxy, and they all look and act different. And only 12 of them eat people. So a lot of them are like so, so, so civil, basically. Huh? So, so a lot of them are civil, maybe. Oh, yeah. Some of them are even vegetarians. Oh. So. This was fascinating, Penny. But this was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all this stuff today. This was amazing. I'll try. I'll probably. I'm probably going to put it out tomorrow because I have to record a couple other things tonight. But then, I, and I want to be able to make sure I put all the links. I don't want to rush it or anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want to make sure I put all the links in, and you know, yeah, all that the stuff. Clips so. I talked about. Yeah. And the clips that I showed are not part of the the videos on my on my Odyssey. They were things that I had. I put together some clip compilations in support of David Gresh's testimony before Congress. What are you trying to work on more, um, Rumble or, or Odyssey? I prefer Odyssey, but I have more followers on Rumble. Here's your so, Odyssey. I'll show people. Um, it's, you guys just come to Odyssey and just look up Nockwaff and Pilot. If you guys look up right here, down at where my mouse is, like, you know, and you'll see Penny's uh, site, you know, and I don't have a lot of followers on Odyssey either. I, I have hardly barely any, if not, not, I have more on Rumble, you well, know. They get, they get confused about how to spell Odyssey. Yeah. But yeah. It, it's 
actually a really good site. They don't censor. Uh, it's only $5 a month to have a channel. Um, you can watch for free. People can donate to you. Um, I've got just over 200. Well, I'm in the, yeah, about 220s in followers, but most of, most of my videos are getting more watches than I have followers. Yeah, that's that's what happened to me on Rumble too. I, I think I just hit a thousand on Rumble, and some of my really good videos on Rumble have well over, or not well over, but like over a thousand views. So it makes me think, what the hell is YouTube doing? Like, you know, like that we have more that's followers, great. but we're getting less views. You know, well, I have, I have gained almost a thousand followers since I stopped uploading on YouTube. I stopped uploading because they deleted three videos. Yeah. And the fourth one, they would have taken down the channel. So instead of risking it, I just haven't uploaded anything. And then this year, last month, they deleted another one. So, um, uh, I'm in the process of moving everything. Okay. You know, when Daryl was, was my producer, he would have me interview people that he liked. Yeah. And he thought it was about the numbers. And he and I got into several fights because I did not want to interview those people. And so the ones that, that, I have I have evidence they're liars. And so those videos are not coming to Rumble or Odyssey. I'm just not doing it. Um, they can stay on YouTube until YouTube deletes the channel. I am continuing to respond to comments on YouTube, but I'm not uploading anything. I've had several places on it where I've uploaded the link to Odyssey. And this is where this is where my new stuff is. What's on Rumble right now is ongoing archival work because they take it in the order you upload it. And when I get to the point where I'm current, then I'm going to, to upload new work to both. But at the moment, Odyssey is where my new work is. And uh, I don't know, you know, if people decide they're going to stop donating, Rumble is charging me $100 a month. Wow. Yeah, that's what I thought. That jump from $25 to $100 a month that was hard and the people on my patreon i talked to them about it and they said they wanted to support it and they've sent me the money so i'm i'm really grateful for them i'm not asking for i'm not asking them to support my lifestyle i have enough money to make ends meet i don't have enough money to pay a hundred dollars a month for rumble yeah so if the support stops, so will the rumble. <laughs> well, how can people um, support you? Like, how can they donate to you? What's the easiest way? I can put a link in the description. Um, through my Patreon. Okay. And what's that? Is it patreon.com slash? Uh, I can give you the ID number. Yeah, because if you could send it to me, I'll I'll, I'll put it in the, the yeah, description I'll, I'll for tomorrow. Send, I'll send it to you in the... Um, in messenger but yeah um i've had patreon for several years now and uh i've gotten to where i have enough consistent donations to be able to keep the rumble afloat and cool. i'm grateful i'm not asking for anybody to give a lot of money you know five ten dollars a month is fine with me yeah i don't i don't want to be a burden to anybody 
Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I I I I I mean I feel the same way about myself too. Like I, when I ask people for donate, you know what I mean? Like I I know what it's like cuz it's hard right now, right? It's like it's like it's but hard like for everybody. It is. It's 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 rough times. It really is. Um So if if they can if they can swing 5 to 10 dollars a month, I'm just absolutely tickled with that. Yeah. So Okay. Well, send me the link and thanks, Penny. And is there and anything else you want to say before we finish up for tonight? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I always do. I love doing shows with you. It's so much fun. So thank you too. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Have a good night. Bye.